What you have just heard is what sometimes is referred to as John's version of the Christmas story, which for John begins not just in Bethlehem, but back at the very beginning of creation. For the Word was with God and the Word was God. All things were created through the Word. And where at what we know is that first Christmas long ago, John tells us the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God came to know us and understand us by being one of us so that we might have the possibility of becoming one of his. Thank you, choir, for your message this morning. Besides John's version of the Christmas story, you'll find Christmas stories in the first and second chapter of Luke. I would ask you to read those sometimes this month. You will find them in the first and second chapter of Matthew. We're going to look at part of that story this morning. You can find it in a hymn that Paul records for us in Philippians about Christ leaving the best in heaven to become one of us here. And you can find it as you reflect upon what for many of us is the gospel in miniature, John 3.16. For just a few moments this morning, hear these words from Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 following. Now the birth of Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Marriage among the Jewish people in those days actually took place in three different phases. First of all, the families of the prospective bride and groom agreed that the marriage ought to take place. The second phase was a public announcement where the families announced that their son, their daughter, were to be married. That engagement, sometimes referred to as a betrothal, was so set in stone that you could not get out of it without a divorce. It wasn't like our engagements today where you can give back a wedding ring or give back an engagement ring. Once you were officially engaged, as Mary and Joseph were, you were bound together. You did not have marital relations. You didn't live together as husband and wife, but it was set. And then the third phase would be the marriage itself. And you know, for Jewish people of that day, marriage celebrations were festive and joyful. And Jesus himself, along with his disciples, not only attended and participated and celebrated, but Jesus performed a miracle at the wedding in Canaan. So, now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way when his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph. It was already set. But before they lived together, the marriage had not yet taken place. She was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit, which if you think about it, posed a great dilemma for Mary and Joseph both. But her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. Joseph, at least from his perspective at that time, had two options. He could divorce Mary quietly and get out of the engagement. Or if he literally went by the Jewish law, he could turn her over to the religious authorities. And according to the letter of the law, she could be stoned to death. So Joseph, being a just man and not willing to make a public example of this woman that he loved, thought his only option was to divorce Mary quietly. But there was a third option that Joseph had not thought about, which he was to learn. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, 
for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And Matthew, whose gospel is geared to convincing the Jewish people that the Messiah that's prophesied in the Hebrew Bible was Jesus, Matthew is always quoting the Old Testament scripture. Here's the very first time that he does that. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary as his wife but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son and he named him Jesus. What an incredible story that we remember and depend upon the birth of our Savior. Most Often, this time of year, I remember something that happened to me long ago. It actually happened in the summer. We were still living way back in Midway. John Robert, John, you hadn't been born yet, but his two sisters were three and two respectively, and our girls decided it was time for them to have a swing set. Hey, Dad, everybody else at the subdivision has a swing set. Why can't we have a swing set? And my dear wife said, our backyard would look more like a family backyard if we had a swing set like everybody else. So I thought, swing set, sure, we'll keep all the women in my life happy. So we went to a store, and there it was, a swing set. It was magnificent. And the kids loved it, and Deborah liked it, and I liked it because it was on sale. And I thought, this is great. It had two swings a swinging bar. It had a teeter-totter, which was pretty cool back in those days, and an attached slide. We'll take this one, I said to the clerk. Great, he said. Can I pick it up tomorrow? Sure. I'll be back. Well, the next day, I borrowed my dad's pickup truck and took off to the store. That swing set ought to fit right in the back of the bed of his pickup truck, I thought. So I got to the store and went around back to the loading dock and handed the gentleman on the dock the invoice and said, I'm here to pick up the swing set that I bought yesterday. Great, he said, here it is. There were two brown boxes on the loading dock and one was long and skinny and the other was short and bulky. And I said, oh, there must be some mistake. I came to pick up the swing set that's on the floor of the store. Oh, that's just for display only, he said. We never, never sell a swing set already assembled. And he put the two boxes in my dad's pickup truck. Besides, he said, you can do this. Just follow the directions. And as he went off on the loading dock, he said under his breath, and good luck. <laughs> well, I took the two boxes back home. Deborah said, Where, where's the swing set? And I said, here it is. I've never seen as many parts and bolts and nuts and washers. Oh man, and I, I did read the directions and that began, that began a two day, 14 hour a day process for me when I finally managed to get the swing set put together and miraculously enough, it, it worked, it held. Praise God. <laughs> well, that swing set's long gone. My kids have grown up. Now there's a great playground at the park close to where we live and we use that instead. But every time I still see a swing set or a slide, I'm, I'm reminded of that and I'm reminded of the message that was on those two boxes that I had neglected to see some assembly required. Some assembly required. That's not only good for swing sets, if you think about it, that's good for a lot of things. That's good for life. Some assembly required, that's 
That's good for Christmas. Well, it was about that time that I was thinking about the, the swing set that I ran across a, a story from Robert Fulgham, and well, it speaks for itself. It's what happened to him one Christmas. I always wanted a cuckoo clock, he said, a big Baroque German job with all kinds of carved designs and a little bird that leaps out once an hour and hollers an existential comment about life. So I got one for my wife. See, the, the way this deal works is that she usually doesn't really like what I give her for Christmas anyway, and I usually end up with it myself in the end. So I figured I might as well start out by giving her something that I want in the first place so that when I get it back, I can be truly grateful. She gets the thought, I get the gift. I know it's wicked, but it's realistic and practical. And don't get so high-minded about this as if you would never think of doing such a thing. You would. I've been around. I know what I know. Anyway, I wanted an authentic antique cuckoo clock. But they cost a bundle. But this store had new ones, overstocked, a special cheap price, hot deal. So I bought one. There were two messages written in small print on the carton, which I missed reading entirely. Made in South Korea was one, and some assembly is required was the other. Well, the carton produced five plastic bags of miscellaneous parts and an artificial Bavarian alpine goat herd hut marked genuine simulated wood. And to top it off, a plastic deer head that looked like Bambi's mother. I put it all together with no parts left over, thank you, and hung it on the wall. Pulled down the weights, pushed the pendulum, stepped back. It ticked and talked in a most comforting manner. Never before had such an enterprise gone so well for me. The thing actually worked. The hour struck. The little door opened. The little bird did not come out. But from deep inside its little hole came a raspy, muffled, kuka, kuka. Kuka, three kukas, that's it, that's all, but the hands of the clock said noon. I peered deep inside the innards of the Bavarian Alpine goat herd hut of simulated wood. There was the bird. Using an ice pick and a chopstick, I tried to pry the creature forth. It seemed loose. I reset the clock to three, the clock ticked and talked and then clanged. The door was flung open, no bird. Out of the darkness at the back of the hut came kook, but no oo, not even a ka. And so applying the principle of if it won't move, force it, I resorted to a rubber mallet and a coat hanger followed by a vigorous shaking. Reset the clock, hour struck, door open, silence. Close inspection revealed a small corpse with a spring around its neck lying on its side. Not many people have murdered a cuckoo clock bird, but I had done it. I could see Christmas morning. Here, dear, a cuckoo clock for you. The bird is dead. <laughs> I gave her the clock and I told her the story and she laughed and she kept the clock too, dead bird and all for a while. And well, the clock and the dead bird are long gone now. Christmas has come and gone many times, but the story gets told every year when we gather with our friends in December and they laugh, we all laugh. My wife looks at me and grins her grin and I grin back and she reminds me that the real cuckoo bird in the deal was not the critter inside the clock. <laughs> well, I still don't have a cuckoo clock of my own, but I have kept something. It's the memory of the Christmas message written on the packing carton, some assembly is required. To gather up the very best that is within you and to assemble with those you love, assembly required. Christmas message, you better believe it. Because if you really want Christmas to happen, if you are really serious about celebrating this in incredible gift of God's Son, some assembly on our parts is going to be required. First thing that's got to happen <clears throat> is we've got to read the directions. Do you read directions? 
I do because of a handy Andy, I can fix anything in a jiffy person. I'm not. If I don't follow the directions, I'm in trouble. If I don't follow the directions, I'm lost. Now I know there's some people, you know, like Jim Humphrey and Scott Moss and you know, Nick Kites, and they probably don't have to read directions. They can just put it all together, but I am not one of those people, so I read those directions and follow them, and sometimes it turns out okay. Incidentally, did you notice in the Christmas story in the Bible that there are all kinds of directions? Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. The child that she is carrying is the very son of God, Joseph. Your wife's going to be the mother of the Savior of the world, so go to Bethlehem, Joseph. Carry out this marriage, Joseph. Be a good father figure, Joseph. Some assembly is required. Mary. Don't be afraid, Mary. The child that is within you is a holy child. It's God's child. Mary, you're going to be the mother of the Savior of the world. Don't be afraid, Mary. You will have a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Follow the directions, Mary. Some assembly is required. Shepherds? The angel said to the shepherds, don't, don't be afraid, shepherds, just because of this bright light in the sky. Shepherds, I want, you, I want you to go to Bethlehem. Shepherds, I, I'm, I'm bringing you good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you, shepherds, is born this day in the city of David, Bethlehem, a Savior who's Christ the Lord. And shepherds, this will be a sign. Here are your directions, shepherds. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a babe there, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Go to Bethlehem, shepherds. Follow the direction, shepherds. Some assembly is required. That bright star in the eastern sky was noted by wise men who were astrologers in science folks of that day, probably over in Persia. Follow the star, wise men. Search out the newborn king, wise men. Go and find him and worship him, wise men. Follow the directions. Some assembly is required. Listen. Listen. If we are really serious about celebrating what Advent and Christmas is all about, we can't just sit back and wave a magic wand or push a button and think that December 25th is going to come around here and everything's going to be great about Christmas. Now, if we really want to celebrate, if we really want to have some hope, if we really want to know the greatest gift ever given, the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, some assembly on our part is required to accept Christ, to join the church, to participate in the Christmas project, to worship the newborn king, to invite a friend to the Christmas Eve candlelight communion service, some assembly on our part is required follow the directions something else we need to keep in mind is that we need to assemble with those we love assemble with family assemble with friends certainly but assemble with the church there are some directions about church assembling in holy scripture too over in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, the 25th verse, at a time when Christians were very, very discouraged. I don't know if it was Christmas time or not, but they were down and out. And God inspired the biblical writer to say, do not forsake assembling yourselves together as is the habit of some. 
You want to celebrate Christmas? Assemble yourselves together with one another because assembling ourselves together is to give a witness. It's to worship. It's to feel the joy of the Christmas season. Long ago, John Killinger pastored the first congregational church in Los Angeles, California. He had a 101-year-old lady in his church named Fanny Moore. She never missed church. She came every Sunday. And it became a ritual that John Killinger would say, how you doing this morning, Fanny? Well, I didn't feel so good. I didn't feel like coming to church. But I said to myself, get up, old woman, and go to church. And she did. And she did. Even when she didn't feel like it, even when some folks thought, what in the world are you doing being 101 years old and coming to church? She came to church because she wanted to give a witness, because she wanted to worship, because she wanted to experience the joy that can only take place, I think, within the context of a congregation at Christmas time. So this Advent season, and there will be those times after you've stayed out late at a party on Saturday night or whatever. Uh, remember, remember Fanny Moore. Get up. Go to church. One other thing that, that happens is be sure as you're getting your Christmas together that all the parts are included. Have you ever found yourself staying up late, putting together last minute of a Christmas present, and you're tired and it's 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning and you look around and, and some parts are missing? And you don't have the right tools? And the batteries are not included? And, and the neighbors, the neighbors from whom you always borrow everything, they're already asleep, it's 2.30 in the morning, and all the stores are closed. You know, one of the things the directions say is, be sure all the parts are here. Sometimes they give you illustrations. Be sure you got all the parts. There are a lot of parts that you can put together during Christmas. But hopefully there's one part that you will not leave out. It's what Christmas is about, ladies and gentlemen the gift of Christ. Well, and then finally, just gather up the very best that is within you and give it away. Don't do this slipshod, give God what's left over stuff. Gather up the very best that is within you through your worship and your talents and your resources and your love for other people. Gather up the very best that is within you this Advent season and give it away. Anybody here from Jenkins, Kentucky? Anybody know where Jenkins, Kentucky is? I see my Eastern Kentucky folk. 1982, 98% of the people in Jenkins, Kentucky were Protestants. Probably still are that percentage. But in 1982, Jenkins, which was one of these boomer bust coal towns at that point, it, it was bad. It was a down cycle. P people were, I mean, incredibly poor. And four nuns from the Order of Mother Teresa the missionaries of charity came to town and moved in. They moved in to what they made into a house that formerly had been a beauty shop and a barber shop, and, and they moved in and they had carpet there, but nobody else in the town had much carpet, so they ripped the carpet out and they gave it away. And hey, they had a washing machine and a dryer there, but they took it out and gave it to somebody who didn't have one and they washed, they washed their clothes by hand. And those four nuns started going door to door and just saying, is there anything we can do to help you? What? Is there anything we can do to help you? And they did. 
They built a shelter for battered women and their children. They started a food bank. They visited the poorest of the poor in Jenkins, Kentucky. And Baptist people said, I don't know a whole lot about Catholics, but boy, I'm sure glad they're here. And then Mother Teresa, get this, halfway around the world, she came to Jenkins, Kentucky. And she inspired even more people to get involved in what the missionaries of charity were doing. And they finally said, well, Mother Teresa, why are you doing this? What, what's the deal? And she just said, we're just doing something for Jesus. Without him, our life is incomplete. We're just doing something for Jesus. Gather up the very best that is within you. Give it away. Well, that swing set's long gone. But the message that it conveyed to me still remains. If you really want to celebrate Christmas, if you really want to worship the Christ child, if you really want to be a follower of what this holiday is all about, then assemble yourselves together and read the directions. And be sure you include all the parts. Assemble the very best that is within you and give it away some assembly is required.